It is now 6 p.m. on Tuesday, October 3rd, 2023, and I'm going to call the City of Iowa City meeting to order. Roll call, please. Alter. Here. Fergus. Here. Dunn. Here. Harmson. Taylor. Here. Teague. Here. Thomas. Here. All right. Welcome to your City Hall, to everyone in the audience, and to those that are joining us virtually. Welcome as well. Andrew Dunn, Councilor Dunn, is with us virtually today. We're on items number two, which is proclamations. 2A is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and this will be read by Mayor Pro Tem Alter. Whereas domestic abuse, dating abuse, and stalking affects women, children, and men of all racial, cultural, and economic backgrounds, causing long-term physical, psychological, and emotional harm, and whereas one in three Americans have witnessed an incident of domestic violence, and whereas children who experience domestic violent abuse are at higher risk for failure in school, mental illness, substance abuse, suicide, and may choose violence as a way to solve problems later in life. And whereas domestic abuse in rural communities exists as a hidden, silent, and often unrecognized crime that is often underreported, and whereas through the inspiration, courage, and persistence of victims of domestic abuse, their children, and advocates, our communities are learning to recognize the impact of violence in the home and within intimate relationships. And whereas the Domestic Violence Intervention Program has worked to end violence and abuse in intimate relationships for more than 43 years, through the collaborative partnerships of advocates, volunteers, local municipalities, criminal justice, health and human services, faith communities, business leaders, and private citizens. And whereas our community's achievements should be commended, and we must continue our commitment to respect and support victims of domestic abuse and to prevent future violence in our community. Now, therefore, I, Megan Alter, Mayor Pro Tem of Iowa City, on behalf of Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the month of October 23, 2023 to be Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Iowa City, Iowa, and urge all community members to work together to eliminate domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking from our community. And here to accept is Alta Medea. Um, I first want to thank all of you for all of your support of DVIP over all of the past years, 44 years now, officially, um, as well as uh, the support for the Finding Safety Building Hope capital campaign for the new shelter. Um, I handed out some forms, but just wanted to highlight a couple numbers. The first being that we helped 969 Iowa City residents in the past year. Um, and we provided 15% more services to those individuals than we have in previous years. Um, that indicates that the need of each victim is growing, as we would expect with all of the other social constraints. But um, we are able to do that because of support like yours. We also have a number of events celebrating uh, victim survivors and providing their basic needs that I did want to draw the council's attention to. The first is on October 14th. That's our Shop for Shelter, and many of you have volunteered and helped with that. Um, and we are also doing a panel discussion discussing the effects of poverty on domestic violence victims and how those two um, pieces really impact economic abuse as well as the, the tr sort of traditional f physical and emotional emotional abuse that we think of when we think of victim survivors, and that is on October 18th. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the numbers or about the campaign if you have them. Um, we are nearly 80% of the way toward our fundraising goal, in large part thanks to the City of Iowa City and our community here. Thank you so much for yeah. being here today, and we just applaud all of the work that you all do. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Item 2B of proclamations is Fire Prevention Week, and this is read by Councillor Taylor. 
whereas the city of Iowa City is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting Iowa City, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire, and whereas home fires killed 2,880 people in the United States in 2021, according to the National Fire Protection Association, and fire departments in the United States responded to 361,000 residential fires. And whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half, and three out of five home fire deaths result from fires in properties without working smoke alarms. And whereas half of home fire deaths result from fires reported at night between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. when most people are asleep. And whereas Iowa City first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention, protection, and education. And whereas Iowa City residents are responsive to public education measures and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. And whereas the 2023 Fire Prevention Week theme, Cooking Safety Starts With You, effectively reminds us that cooking fires are the number one cause of home fire and home injuries. Now, therefore, I, Pauline Taylor, on behalf of Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim October 8th to 14th, 2023, as Fire Prevention Week throughout the city and urge everyone to install smoke alarms and to support the many public safety activities and efforts during Fire Prevention Week 2023 and year round. Accepting is Lieutenant Alex Swanson from the Iowa City Fire Department. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor, Mayor, Council Members. If I may have a few words, uh, Fire Prevention Week uh, is a reminder to learn and identify hazards in our homes to keep ourselves, loved ones, and others safe. We must actively take the steps necessary to prevent fires before they start, to have working smoke alarms so that we may uh, get out safely in case of a fire, and take the steps necessary to prevent burn injuries from cooking and other heat sources. To learn more about this, a good start is the National Fire Protection Association's website. They have a Fire Prevention Week website. It's fpw.org. Pretty easy one. And of course, you can always visit the Iowa City Fire Department. Uh, we have four stations. You can give us a call or email us. We'll be happy to help. So thank you very much for the time to recognize Fire Prevention Week coming up October 8th through the 14th. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Item 2C is Indigenous Peoples Week. Whereas the city of Iowa City recognizes that the indigenous peoples of the lands that would later become known as the Americas have occupied these lands since time immemorial. And whereas the city recognizes the fact that Iowa City is built upon the homelands and villages of the indigenous people of this region. And whereas the city is dedicated to opposing systemic racism towards indigenous people, which perpetrates high rates of poverty and income inequality, as exacerbating disproportionate health, education, and social crises. And whereas Indigenous Peoples Day was first proposed in 1977 by a delegation of Native Nations to the United Nations, sponsor International Conference on Discrimination Against Indigenous Populations and the Americas. And whereas the city strongly supports the preposition, the preposition that Indigenous Peoples Day shall be an opportunity to celebrate the thriving cultures and values of the indigenous peoples of the region. And whereas the city strongly encourages schools to include the teaching of indigenous peoples, history in its curriculum, and encourages other businesses, organizations, and institutions 
to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. Now therefore I, Mayor, I, now therefore I Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim October 9th, 2023 as Indigenous People Day in Iowa City. And to receive this is Sakawas Novis of Greater Plains Action Society. Hi, that's Great Plains Action Society. Um, thank you very much, Ahai Kitatamahin. And um, it's always nice to see uh, Indigenous peoples uh, and our issues and uh, our movements being recognized. Um, <clears throat> and I hope that we can go beyond proclamations sometime soon and create uh, more partnerships, stronger partnerships. I'm really excited this year uh, that the Parks and Recreation Department reached out to me and I'm uh, working with them and the Office of well, I, we are actually, myself and Jessica Engel King from our organization are working with um, Parks and Recreation, uh, the city, um, or the um, Office of, of Equity and, in, and Human Rights, and then the um, Human Rights Commission. So it's been really great. Um, I recently had some talks with the Human Rights Commission about the needs of the indigenous community. And so we're, we're doing what we can. And of course, all of you here know that I'm on the uh, <laughs> Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So you know how I feel about a lot of those things that need to be done here and everywhere, actually, on this stolen land um, as we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, and I want to tell a story because it's a really important story. I want to talk about 2020 and um, in Des Moines when we were holding uh, our annual July 4th uh, Abolish Monuments to White Supremacy uh, rally uh, because it's as Indigenous peoples uh, celebrating July 4th can be kind of difficult. and. Um, you know, we like to talk about uh, the, the, all the monuments all over the state and the country that um, are up, uh, not just monuments, but um, murals and, 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 you know, other kind of edifices that you see um, that uh, basically depict, you know, white supremacy and, and colonial capitalism. And so we, we had our, you know, typical rally that we have, which is always peaceful. Um, and we usually have it in front of the, the two white settler invaders uh, with the, um, the native sitting by their feet pointing westward, uh, showing them a way uh, to find a home. And uh, about 100 white supremacists or nationalists showed up with guns. And, and that's because they wanted to protect their Columbus uh, monument. They wanted to protect the bust of Columbus, which is over on the other side of the of the, um, uh, the the grounds, and um, you know we weren't there to destroy anything. We weren't there to take anything down. But I know that there was tension in 2020, of course, and so um, they were there and they told us not to bring our children. And we had a lot of threats ahead of time, but we showed up anyways. And I just want you to know that this is the kind of sentiment that still um, is here in this country. And just celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day, just giving us a proclamation, is not enough. Like we need to do more, right? So that's why I'm happy that we're celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day, first of all. But also what we need to do is negate Columbus Day because that's still celebrated. It's still on the books federally and it's still on the books here um, statewide as well. So how do we actually like truly celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day if Columbus Day is still also uh, being proclaimed? So I would ask that uh, the city of Iowa City, you know, maybe do something about that. Maybe be the first city to um, say, hey, like, no to, like, Columbus Day, period, but also no to, you know, our administration, our state administration, no to the federal government. Like, let's get this off the calendar, period, because we can't truly celebrate uh, Indigenous Peoples Day if we're also still, like, allowing uh, people to uplift, you know, a murderer, a rapist, uh, a slave trader, whatever you want to... He was all those things. He was, you know, the worst of the worst. And, um, you know, let's just, let's do better. So, Ahai um, Kitatamahin, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming today. We're going to move on to our... Uh, consent agenda, which is items three through six. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Taylor. 
Second. Alter. All right. And would anyone from the public like to address uh, anything on our consent agenda? If you're online, please raise your hand. I see no one in person or online. Council discussion. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, 6E, donation to animal shelter. I was just so highly impressed and moved by this and, and would like to express my sincere thanks to to her. It was a do donation to the animal shelter by Jacqueline Flank, uh, who named the Iowa City Animal and uh, Adoption Center as a beneficiary in a life insurance policy. And it just brings me to tears to even think about that. The animal shelter is a, a, a great part of Iowa City and can always use as many donations as possible. It costs a lot of money. And uh, as we saw recently, they received over 130 something dogs and, and had to really scramble to, to make ends meet to, to have shelter for those animals. So thank you again to um, Jacqueline Flink. And uh, for my part, I just want to bring up actually notice of uh, 6D just in passing here, but um, it's exciting that the winter shelter agreement has gone through um, and that there will be an emergency additional temporary overnight shelter during the winter months. Uh, and much kudos to staff and uh, Shelter House for working together to um, get this up and running and to have this in place. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item number eight is planning and zoning matters. 8A, zoning code Mayor. amendment, housing choice, supply, and affordability. Item seven. Community comment. Do we skip that? For the past one? Uh, no, and for the whole, comment. not on the agenda. Sorry. <laughs> we did. <laughs> Typically, it, it has this, yeah, its own page, and I like it. Yeah. And I looked over it. All right, we are at item number seven, which is community comment. This is an opportunity for your voice to be heard on any item that is not on our agenda. And we are going to allow uh, individuals three minutes to speak um, during this time. And just for notification, we do have sign in at the podium, but also some stickers in the back that people can drop in the box. And we're going to welcome. Welcome. Hey, Brandon Ross from Iowa City. Uh, good to see you at City Council. Um, I'm a Democrat. I'm not against Republicans. You people are cool, too. I'm anti-fascist, though. I, uh, I'm anti-Nazi. I'm anti-fascist. I want to bring up that uh, on the day of Yom Kippur, which is a Jewish highest holiday. I'm Jewish on my mom's side. We're, we're Ukrainian Jewish and some Polish Jewish. That uh, in the uh, Canadian Parliament, tribute was paid and applauded by Justin Trudeau and Vladimir Zelensky to a Ukrainian Nazi Waffen SS soldier from World War II uh, on the holiest day of the year, tribute was paid to a fascist. And um, it was appalling. Uh, it was appalling to me. It was appalling to my family. Um, and sometimes, though, something is just what it is. Uh, the Canadian Parliament tried to back it up. It was not very well done. Uh, Zelensky went to back to Ukraine, to Baba Yar, where 100,000 Jews were killed in Western Ukraine to try to show that he was not fascist. But unfortunately, uh, the government that is in power is actually in Ukraine, is a fascist uh, neo-Nazi government. And this started in 2014, when Viktor Yanukovych was overthrown. He was democratically, democratically elected. Uh, the U.S. had a part in that. And then fascist militias actually attacked Eastern Ukrainians for over eight years. Zelensky came to power in 2019 with 70% popularity. By the end of 2021, he had 24% popularity. 
He had opposition leaders who were more popular than the him imprisoned. He had opposition parties closed down. He had opposition media closed down. He had Russian language denied in public office. He also had closed down churches that were Russian Orthodox within Ukraine. Russian is the second language in Ukraine, but two-thirds to three-quarters of the people speak it, one-third speak it as a first language, and so too Zelensky. Right now, the United States is supporting a fascist neo-Nazi neo regime, and we should pull our money out. And I beg people in Iowa City, Johnson County, to call for negotiations within the Democratic Party, of which I am a member. Call for negotiations. No more weapons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address a topic that is not on our agenda? Seeing no one in person or online, I'm going to close the uh, public comment time. I'm going to move on to items number eight, planning and zoning matters. 8A is zoning code amendment, housing choice, supply and affordability. Ordinance amending Title 14 zoning code to improve housing choice, increase housing supply, and encourage housing affordability. This is the second consideration. And can I get a motion to consider it, please? So moved to alter. Second, Burgess. All right. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Yes. And we welcome you. There is a sign in there. Yep. And I'm uh, going to allow three minutes. Right. Um, I tried to keep my remarks to three minutes. Um, but um, if I go over a, a sentence or two, it's on here. But I wanted to pass these out because there are a couple of photographs at the bottom that, I, that are part of what I'm saying. Great. So I'll just leave. Well, I'll, I'll bring them up after. Okay. Um, I'm Mary Beth Sloniger, and I'm from Goose Town. So I'm just talking for myself tonight. At the end of July, I was informed that a 40-some pa page packet was propo with proposed changes to zoning was underway. I was leaving on a three-week vacation, so didn't have time to read through this quite dense document, but a number of items stood out that raised concern. When I got back, I took time to speak with some neighbors on both sides of Davenport Street. None of them were aware of the document or of the proposed changes. Some probably still aren't. It concerns me that this will impact homeowners in a big way, and they haven't received a notification letter from the city. The other concern is it is happening very fast. Uh, personally, I think the process should be slowed down to be absorbed by those who will be impacted. Secondly, because I recalled no letter from the city, I felt I had to find out on my own who owned properties, who rented properties, and who held them in some company's name. I came up with the following numbers for Goose Town, including Dodge to Reno, Bloomington to Ronalds. By my count, there are 269 houses owned by 52 LC, LLC, management companies, trusts, and two housing fellowships for a total of about 30% of Goose Town, already being rented, and that doesn't count unknown rentals by individual owners. That means that about every third house is rented, creating great turnover, not knowing neighbors, lack of stability, and a fear that some developer is coming in to replace the house next door with a possible two unit or third behind. Please try to imagine this happening in your own neighborhood. One neighbor told me that she had meant to build a lovely matching garage to her home, but found out that a developer had bought next door and was reluctant to invest now, not knowing what he would build. Her concern is correct. In the last year, four nearby houses have been demolished. A small historic cottage at 935 Bloomington was one of those. Its rebuild uh, sold recently for $536,220. Is this what is meant by affordable housing? 
Please consider the profits for developers that this is creating or will create. Goose Town is at their mercy, and we have been forewarned at a planning and zoning meeting. Thank you. All and right. you can pass it to our city clerk. Right. Clients. I hope you'll please look at the Thank last you. couple of sentences. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. Well, thank you. My name is Karen Covey. I live in Iowa City. And it was kind of uncanny today that I sent an email to city council because I've had lots of people ask me questions and I was confused about whether this ordinance um, embedded density bonuses by right of the zoning or if it was triggered by providing affordable housing. And then talked with some council members today and found out that there was some discussion about trying to do the latter. And um, I'm hoping that you'll talk about that a little bit. And um, if, um, I don't know what the plans are today, if this will be deferred so that you can have that conversation so that density bonuses are provided when the, d the redevelopment or the increased density provides something the community sorely needs, and that's affordable housing. I love that the framework for that is income-based. I think that's a really good framework. So I know there'll be some discussion about uh, is there precedent for that, which I think there is in the code, but there, there's, it might decrease how much increased density there is, and I think that's a policy decision versus a legal one, although your city attorney will guide you on all of that. And I'm hoping nonprofits will really be the entities that want to do this. And maybe if you move in this direction, maybe it's a pilot program that's just in the university impact zone versus all neighborhoods that have this zoning. So I'm hoping to hear some discussion about this tonight and hope that you'll end up deferring so that you can really uh, seriously consider this option. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? <clears throat> Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion. I would like to make a motion uh, this evening to defer our second vote until October 17th to allow time for staff to explore ways to use the zoning amendment to further advance the council goal of creating income restricted affordable housing in addition to increasing housing supply and choice. I would be in favor of that. So moved by Thomas, uh, seconded by Taylor. Um, any further discussion on that item? I would be in favor just to allow time some, allow staff some time to get some information to us. I would also agree with that because um, hopefully Councilor Hermson will be with us too, so we'd have a full council to discuss it. If no other discussion, roll call please. And this is a motion this to defer. This is a voice vote, so just uh, all of the oh, favor. Yep. So this is a motion to defer until our next meeting. October 17th, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Motion passes, six to zero. Mr. Mayor, before we move on, just if there are any questions that staff may have about what's being proposed, is it okay if we direct those questions to Councilor Thomas? He and I have had a little bit of discussion, so I have a good idea about what he's uh, thinking of, but just so staff comes fully prepared to uh, uh, discuss the matter with you. I'm comfortable with that, our people comfortable with that thank you yeah could you please uh cc me on that as well counselor don wants cc'd on any other correspondence certainly yeah all right great we're moving on to item number 8b which Mayor, is the reason i'm sorry could we get a motion to accept correspondence all right oh sure so moved second yes. <laughs> uh moved by uh burgess seconded by Taylor to accept correspondence. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Item number 8B is rezoning 715 North Dodge Street, local historic landmark. Ordinance rezoning property located at 715 North Dodge Street from medium density single family residential with a historic di district overlay to OHD RS8 in order to designate the property as an Iowa City Historic Landmark. This is second consideration as staff is requesting expedited action. 
Mayor, I move that the rule requiring that ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second. Moved by uh, Taylor, seconded by Dunn. Anyone from the public would like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion. <clears throat> I'm just really excited to see this. I, Emma Goldman is is a, a gem for Iowa City, and it mentions and it mentions healthcare for women. But it's my understanding that uh, men sometimes utilize the services too. So it, it's a it's just a great thing, and uh, it's it's wonderful. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but designated as as the original building as historic is is a good step. I agree with everything that you said. Absolutely. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Could I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved. Second. Moved by Taylor, seconded by Burgess. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item number 9A is Iowa City Senior Center Exterior Building Envelope Preservation, Restoration, and Rehab Rehabilitation. This is a resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the Iowa City Senior Center Exterior Building Envelope Preservation, Restoration, and rehabilitation project, establish an amount of bids, security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders, and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing, and I'm gonna welcome staff up at this time. Welcome. Hello. Hello, I'm Kumi Morris. Actually, we have uh, Peter Franks. He's with Franks Group, and he is the architect that we've been working with with the Senior Center Project. He is uh, an architect that specializes in historic properties, and he has a, a small presentation for you. Thank you, and welcome. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I've been told if I just close out of all the warnings, everything will work just fine. <laughs> Good luck with that. There you go. There you go. Okay. So what we're going to talk about very briefly tonight is uh, the, everything that you see up on, on the agenda here in this first slide. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the project background and also a little bit about the history of the senior center or the old post office building and then we'll get into uh, the project scope and what we're doing here today which is formally the public hearing for the uh, construction documents to be able to be released for public bidding. Um, as Kumi said, my name is Pete Franks or Peter Franks. My firm is the Franks Design Group. We're a small firm based in southwest Iowa, and we work statewide, uh, primarily on historic building projects. We are, uh, we're a small firm. We're a three-person operation. We're in a storefront on the Courthouse Square in Glenwood in Mills County, and we've been in business since 2006. And as I said, we uh, specialize in historic preservation work. Our role with the Senior Center was uh, initiated when we were a preservation consultant to the local architect who was responsible for the Senior Center master plan, initially anchored by Rohrbach Associates uh, in 2020, and then we continued on as a preservation consultant to OPN Architects in 2021 and 2022 as the preservation consultant on the exterior of the building. going to real quick just give you a little bit of interesting, what I think is interesting and hopefully you'll find an interesting history of the building. So what we see here is an old fire insurance map that shows the footprint of the original post office. It was a relatively petite building, 50 feet by 90 feet at the corner of Washington and Lynn. And this is what that building looked like in its first episode between 1904 and 1930. 
So it in fronted primarily Washington Street and had three big window openings, and the secondary elevation was actually the Washington Street elevation. I'm sorry, the Lynn Street elevation. In 1929 to 1931, the building was substantially uh, expanded and went from uh, 90, uh, 50 foot depth to 130 foot depth. So you can see there, we've got the two colors of how much the building grew over the course of that expansion in 1929 to 31. The other thing that was added during that expansion was an entire upper level. So really what was kept of the original building is just what you see highlighted here on the Lynn Street elevation, just really the first three bays, a section of lower wall, but the entire upper wall and the entire upper story was added as part of the expansion, as well as more than doubling the footprint of the building. Here's a construction photo from 1930, and what you can see here is the very dark stone is the original stone that was built in 1904. It's soot stained from just the air pollution that we saw in those decades. Uh, and everything that you see is the lighter stone is the newer stone that was quarried in Indiana and brought here for the expansion project in 1930 and 31. Another construction photo from that same episode, and what's interesting about this, um, I don't know, you can't see my mouse here. The alley elevation, the north elevation of the building here is all this very dark stone, which leads us to believe that that entire wall was dismantled, moved 90 feet to the north, and then reconstructed as part of this massive expansion project that took place in 1929 and 1930. We had the benefit in studying the building and doing our work to have a partial set of the original 1929 drawings to study in detail. It wasn't the complete set, but it was a pretty complete set, which is very helpful to us. And as old building people, we really geek out on things like wall sections and window details and things like that. So we spent a lot of time studying those original drawings in our understanding are uh, compiling our understanding of the building and the technical issues that we're trying to address with this project. Some of the terms that we use as far as the building anatomy goes are outlined here. The one that you're gonna hear me mention in just a moment is the parapet, which is the section of wall that extends up above the roof. And that's uh, the subject of a great deal of the effort that we're investing into the building with this upcoming project. The other thing I want to mention here is that while the building was in the process of being transitioned from federal ownership to city ownership, it was listed in the National Register of Historic Places and it's also designated as a local landmark. The third episode of the building took place under the city's custodial care of the building and that was conversion to the senior center which took place between 1979 and 1981. It was a major comprehensive project involved the insertion of fire stairs, elevators, restrooms, new systems, and adapting the building to the use of the senior center where it's been in use since 1981. And what I, I will say is um, a kind of personal comment here is that it was a very sensitive restoration. When the building was converted to the senior center, it was done in a very, very thoughtful, sensitive way with great attention to detail. So we look at this building as a survivor of one episode in 1904, and then a major expansion that was deftly done in 1930, and then an adaptive reuse that was a comprehensive project in 1981. And there's every reason for us to think that this building can see 150, if not 200 years, if it's well taken care of, including the work that we're proposing. So the major projects that have occurred to the building since that conversion were fire sprinklers and ceilings, boiler replacement, and roof replacement with some assorted masonry repairs about 15 years ago. Part of our work with existing buildings is we really get down and dirty with the existing building and we try and look for the things that need to be repaired and we look for the signs and symptoms of things that need to be corrected or addressed with um, proposed work that we're doing here. So we look for signs of movement. This is actually one of the arches over top of one of the monumental entries on the west elevation. We looked at the full exterior uh, just to be able to find all those places where we see movement or signs of stress and strain. We've got some panels of the stone veneer that are badly eroded uh, along the north elevation particularly. 
But the thing that we really stumbled onto and noticed pretty quickly was that the parapets that extend up above the wall that are where the building meets the sky. We saw a lot of movement really on all four elevations of the, uh, the building. And that's a place where we don't want to see movement. So you can see here in the image here that we've got movement of an inch to an inch and a half, if not two inches, which for a stone building is a lot of physical movement. We've got parapets that we, uh, in, in kind of exploring this a little bit deeper, found that they were out of plumb by as much as four or five degrees. And this is something that uh, becomes al almost on the verge of a safety issue that we don't want that to go any further. So a big part of what we're correcting for is that out of plumb, out of square condition. In our investigation of the building's anatomy, what we discovered and, and uh, really uncovered was that the back face of the parapets, which you see here on this image, are constructed of the same brick uh, that's used for the interior of the walls of the building interior. And that brick has over time been exposed to water that's gotten saturated and been exposed to freeze-thaw deterioration, which then leads it to become more porous, introducing more water into the wall. Ultimately, the freeze-thaw action that we see there is what's responsible for those parapets leaning outwards, as we see really across the board at the roof area. The other thing that we're aware of, this is at the interior of the upper level above the lay-in ceiling. So you can see the lay-in ceiling is kind of what looks like the floor here. So we see signs of really incremental long-term water infiltration above the ceiling there, also related to the parapets and the movement and this brick and stone construction that we see up above there. So we hope that the work that we're proposing here will also take care of any water infiltration or moisture infiltration that's happening in the building or has happened over time. The project scope of work that the public hearing is on tonight is the set of documents that you have available for review prior to the meeting. Uh, it's basically to dismantle and reconstruct the existing limestone parapet piers to correct for out of plumb and out of square and reconstruct with reinforced concrete masonry unit cores, reusing the stone wherever possible as much as possible except where it's damaged beyond repair. At the balustrade sections, we'll be dismantling and reconstructing those. We'll be reintegrating uh, the roof system and terminating the roof where all this perimeter work is going on at the parapet area. And then for the balance of the limestone of the entire building, we'll be doing a masonry veneer restoration, remove and replace the panels that are damaged, uh, effect repairs at the damaged panels, and then repoint everything, and then give the building a good cleaning to get rid of a lot of the soot stain that we see on it, uh, especially up by the main cornice. So a couple pages from the documents that are uh, the exhibit to the public hearing tonight. Details at, at the parapet area. And this whole project has been vetted by your Historic Preservation Commission and given a certificate of appropriateness. The estimated cost for the project for our construction cost is $1,910,000. Our schedule is to, in two weeks, have a pre-bid meeting, assuming we're, we're approved tonight. Bid opening in about five weeks. We expect on-site work to be next year, and then a phase two project that would be the windows and the doors in 24 and 25. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you for that very detailed presentation and use of the word anatomy. That was, I enjoyed that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. All right, anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Taylor. Second, Alter. Council discussion. By the looks of the photos, it's a much needed project and I appreciate your time and effort and, and uh, your plans, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor, if I make, may make a comment. Yes. Uh, I, I hope that uh, folks in the community that um, either view this or become aware of, of the work on the senior center um, are reminded of our council, our community, and our cities overall uh, in, in investment and uh, value of, of the lives of seniors, uh, of their quality of life, um, and the ability for uh, everyone, regardless uh, of their, their place in life, to have 
uh, a really great uh, facility here provided by the community. So um, I want people to know uh, we believe in the senior center. We love the senior center. We want it to uh, be good for folks uh, for many years to come. So I will be supporting, of course. Roll call, please. Dunn? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item 9B is ut <laughs> utility rate public hearing. This is an ordinance amending Title III and Title Finance, Taxation and Fees, Chapter 4 entitled Schedule of Fees, Rates, Charges, Bonds, Fines, and Penalties of the City Code to Increase or Change Charges and Fees. This is second consideration and staff is requesting expedited action. Mayor, I move that the rule requiring that ordinance must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Moved by Taylor. Second. Seconded by Dunn. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Can I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved, Thomas. Second. Second, Oops. Second Burgess. Moved by uh, Thomas, seconded by Burgess. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item number 9C, water code update, lead service lines. This is an ordinance amending Title 16 and Title Public Works, Chapter 3, City Utilities, Article C, Potable Water Use and Service, Section 1, Definitions in Section 3, Connection to Distribution Water Main. This is the first consideration. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. <laughs> moved by uh, Alter, seconded by Burgess. <laughs> and we're going to invite our staff, Ron Kanucky, up from Public Works. Uh, good evening, Council. Ron Kanucky, Public Works Director. Uh, May 2nd, it's your work session. John Durst, our super water superintendent, was here and, and talked about the, our lead reduction program that we're looking at initiating uh, for our water system. Um, this is kind of the first phase, uh, or the first leg of that uh, three-legged stool, as he referred to. Um, you know, as, as, as you're aware, water service lines are privately owned uh, underground, underground water pipes that connect homes uh, or buildings to the city's drinking water system. Uh, some service lines are made of lead or gallon galvanized iron that have been exposed to lead, which leads to lead deposits. The EPA has found that lead in drinking water is known to cause health problems. The proposed ordinance amendment will amend the city code to promote the removal in lead of galvanized or and galvanized iron uh, contaminated lead from water service connections to the potable water system by prohibiting the repair of lead service lines and requiring full replacement of lead service lines when they develop a leak or other defect. Um, with this ordinance change, if it's approved, um, this would become effective January 1 of 2024. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from the public would like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, <laughs> council discussion? I would just observe from our packet that the um, intent here would be to, I think at the time of passage and adoption of this, to uh, that we'll also have a, a proposal for a program to help um, provide essentially an insurance coverage type uh, option that, that folks could um, opt into to purchase so that they, um, to cover the expenses of this because it will be the property owner's expense to replace the service lines when it becomes necessary. And we'll get to that next. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item 9D is marketing agreement, private water and sewer service lines repair plans. 
Resolution authorizing the mayor to sign an agreement by and between the City of Iowa City and the Utility Service Partners Private Label Inc. DBA Service Line Warranties of America to use the city logo for the solicitation of water, sewer, and internal plumbing emergency service plans. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, Alter. All right, and we'll invite Ron up just to kind of talk about this item as well. Yeah. All right, uh, Ron Kanaki, Public Works Director. Um, this resolution will approve a marketing agreement between the city and the service line warranties of America to allow the company to use the city logo on mailed solicitations for optional service line repair plans to Iowa City property owners. The marketing, customer service, and repairs will be managed entirely by the company. Um, the city will have will have review authority of the solicitations prior to mailing and will include information within the solicitations to educate homeowners about service lines, the impacts of lead on human health, and to consult with their homeowners insurance providers. Uh, the timing of this agreement is intended to make the existence of these optional repair plans known to property owners before the effective date of the proposed service line ordinance amendment on January 1, 2024. Great. Uh, questions about the cost. Um. Yeah, so um, the, the the way that the agreement is laid out, uh, there uh, they will solicit two options. Um, the first option will be uh, six dollar and seventy five cent per month for the water service line. Um, the second second option um, would be for sanitary sewer service lines, and that'll be seven dollars and seventy five cents per month. Um, if somebody would decide to provide or go in and accept those services or, or want to um, buy those services. Um, they also provide an interior plumbing um, warranty program and that's $9.99 a month. And all of the costs will be between the resident and um, the service line warranties of America. That's correct. This is a, 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 it would be a direct purchase with that company. Great, thank you. Ron, I just had a question. Um, I mean, it's kind of unusual. Like we approve of a certain company to to have business with with the city and city customers. D did someone like look into and research different insurance companies that would provide the best service for for our city? Yes. Yeah, so um, the the League of Cities uh, is is the company or the the group that has gone out and, and looked at this service line protection program, um, and so um, we're utilizing them as, as that resource. Um, there are a number of, of communities in Iowa that are are utilizing this uh, this service. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to bring them back? No. All right. <laughs> Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion. Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item 9E, assessment of 91 Commercial Drive. Resolution adopting an assessment schedule of, for court-ordered fencing at 91 Commercial Drive and directing the city clerk to certify the same to the Johnson County Treasurer for collection in the same manner as property taxes. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, Thomas. All right, and we're going to turn it over to our city attorney eric thank you mr mayor um i have an unusual request uh and that's uh, i'm going to ask council to defeat this motion or this resolution and the reason for that is uh rather late in the day yesterday we received um payment uh, complete payment for this so obviously that's great for all parties concerned and thus we don't want to well there's nothing else to assess and so i would ask council to defeat this resolution all right, anyone from the public like to make a comment on this? Seeing no one, council discussion. Glad it came to resolution. Absolutely. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Oh. So is. Um, I'm hoping council oh. will vote no. Oh. <laughs> I'm not okay. voting on your motion. Talk well, you about habit. The okay. Right. Sorry. That's right. Sorry, <laughs> all. Oh. No. Okay. I rescind. Uh, Burgess? No. Dunn? No. Taylor? No. Teague? No. Thomas? No. Thank you. Motion fails six, um, 
uh, zero to six. It's also confusing. <laughs> Something it's different all the time, yes. isn't there? Yes, yes. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> yes, thank you. We're at item number 10, which is, which is council appointments. 10A is Climate Action Commission. <clears throat> One vacancy to fill an unexpired position upon appointment through December 31st, 2023. There is no gender balance requirement, and we've had quite a few good applicants. This was an uh, embarrassment I'll just start, yeah, I'll start by thanking all the applicants. I mean, 12 for one position is, is amazing, but uh, looking at the list, there are some um, that will be leaving the commission soon, so keep, keep your thoughts in mind there. But uh, the, the number of individuals who are knowledgeable and informed about the importance of climate action in our community was really impressive. Uh, with community members like these applicants interested in climate action, I have no doubt that Iowa City can achieve our climate action goals. And it, it was hard to narrow down the list, but I'll start by putting forth just a couple of names and see what others are thinking. Um, I liked uh, Angie Smith. Uh, she referred to the challenge of shaping human behaviors, which is kind of what this is all about, uh, to help tackle the climate change. And she is a psychologist, and who knows more about shaping human behavior than a psychologist. Uh, also liked uh, Robert Traer. He says he was in training, but I don't know how long ago his application was to be an I Iowa City Climate Ambassador. He's a retired teacher and has actually given a number of presentations about climate action, which is what it's all about, getting the education out there. But I'm open to what others think. I would offer uh, Michael Anderson. Mm -hmm. I think he's got a really good perspective uh, of the, oh, the whole situation with the climate crisis uh, as a journalist. Um, and I also just really liked a lot of his activism. He uh, reported on and participated in the Standing Rock uh, anti-DAPL Dakota Access Pipeline protest in 2016. Um, and uh, is big on new urbanism, which is something I'm also big on. So um, I would put him forth, uh, as well as uh, Zach Carlson. Uh, but also, I don't, I don't really have any uh, concerns with uh, the people that were mentioned by Councillor Taylor. I would also add um, Hannah Cargo. To the mix, I had also flagged Angie Smith as well as Michael Anderson. Um, what I liked about Hannah was actually um, that she's a student, and that I think that <laughs> given that uh, the sense of urgency is hitting, honestly, uh, the student generation more and more, I think that she brings <coughs> enthusiasm and um, a, a desire to dig in and to reach as many people as possible. I just I thought that she had a lot of qualifications, and I thought honestly um, that her representation would be good on the commission. Well, it, it really was a, an outstanding field, but I I also um, was impressed by Michael Anderson and uh, the the background um, that he that he bring would bring to the commission. Uh, he w he was my first. First choice. My short list was uh, Abigail McCune, Angie Smith, and Michael Anderson. I had also flagged Abigail, so. Okay, so <laughs> I think this is a, a sign that we have a lot of great applicants. Yes. Um, and it, uh, there's, there's a few that, of course, I could support. I think I'll go with Angie Smith, and that will give us four for Angie Smith. All right. Are we all okay with Angie Smith? Mm-hmm. That works. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. For yes. Andrew. All right. So, um, <laughs> could I get a motion to appoint Angie Smith to the Climate Action Commission? So moved. Taylor. Second. Alter. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Mm -hmm. Item number 11 is announcements of vacancies new. 
11A, announce um, Housing and Community Development Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through June 30th, 2025. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved, Taylor. Second, Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Item number 12, announcements of vacancies previous, 12A. Um, this is Historic Preservation Commission, East College Street. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street. One vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Woodlawn Avenue. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. Human Rights Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Upon appointment through December 31st, 2025, applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, October 10th, 2023. Public Art Advisory Committee, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Upon appointment through December 31st, 2024, applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, October 31st, 2023. Item number 13 of City Council information. All right, I'll start. Okay. Surely others have some information, but uh, one thing that I'm really happy to report on was that yesterday I had the pleasure of going on the affordable housing bus tour, which was over three hours long, but it was well worth it. It was hosted by the Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition and the Housing Trust Fund of Iowa City. The tour, which went through the cities of Iowa City, North Liberty, and Coralville, featured uh, 15 homes that are just a handful of the many affordable home projects in the area. Uh, these were rentals, home ownership, and supportive rental units, um, single and multifamily. Uh, we all know that affordable housing plays an essential role in the social and economic development of our community. This tour highlighted the fact that our communities are, and our county are truly indeed have been working hard to provide affordable housing over the past few years and plan to continue doing so. So I'd like to thank uh, Jessica Andino and Ellen McCabe for planning this tour and for all that you do. Uh, it was almost two weeks ago now, but the mayor and I had an opportunity to go to the Iowa League of Cities annual meeting, uh, annual convention conference. Um, let me get three words for the one. But um, it was... Redmond. And Redmond. Yes, that's right. It was incredibly illuminative. There were a lot of really good sessions um, ranging from um, increasing um, mental health support in uh, local municipalities, uh, drawing on actually some examples. I mean, the thing that was great about this conference was honestly that it had to deal with practicalities and things that are going on throughout the state of Iowa. Um, so it wasn't just abstract, like we might do this or we might do that. So um, there was some really interesting presentation about um, a partnership between um, police departments and mental health professionals to um, help divert um, and get people uh, who are in um, it, not a criminal situation, but a mental health crisis situation, the support and follow up that they need. And so that was really, really interesting. Um, and there were some additional uh, sessions that were dealt with finance, which were are going to be incredibly helpful. And then ultimately, um, for my own part, it was the first time that I've been to this conference. And it was really cool because it was understanding the scope and the breadth of specific problems that communities are facing and realizing that um, A, we have a really, really great collaborative um, community that is able to draw upon partners and whatnot, but also to recognize the very specific problems that so much of Iowa has um, because the rural communities were able to be there and have their voices heard and talk about not only problems that they're dealing with, but also solutions that they're finding too. So um, it was just a really, really cool experience. It was my first time, so that's why I'm kind of pontificating on it. Yeah, yeah it, it was good. I think it does speak to the commonalities that big cities, small cities have in common. And also, um, regardless of anyone's individual political background, um, home rule is across the board yeah. what communities want because there is no two communities alike. Yeah. All right.
right, we're going to move on to item number 14, a report from our city staff, and we're going to start in our city manager's office. Well, I was all ready to say pass, but since you brought up the League of Cities, I did want to uh, let the counselors know that I was also there to, to meet with the uh, Metro Coalition, which is a coalition built up of the 12 largest communities in the state of Iowa. And our goal was to sharpen our legislative message for the uh, upcoming session. So as you also know, we're going to be moving uh, towards our practice of uh, looking at our leg uh, legislative priorities uh, coming in the next month or so. So this by actually is a, is a good time to, if there's any legislative priorities that individual counselors uh, have or would like to add a part of the pot. We're kind of going through the process now of, of, of bringing all those ideas together with all those communities and kind of start to narrow it down. So this is the perfect time to add any ideas you may have. So um, just wanted to put that out there. Our city attorney's office. Uh, I'll offer this uh, time that uh, Jennifer Swickerath, one of the uh, attorneys in our office, uh, the most recent addition to our office, uh, had the opportunity and took it to attend the International Municipal Lawyers Association uh, annual conference, which was in California. It cost her uh, last weekend, but uh, she thought it was a great uh, program. It is certainly robust. Um, IMLA, as we refer to it, um, it has a number of interest uh, groups that are of value to the city, and in my experience, including university city group that I uh, participate in quarterly calls. Um, I believe in IMLA enough that I've served as state chair for several years. I've since given up uh, that mantle, um, proud as it may be. Um, but it was a great opportunity for her to get out and make some uh, relationships with other city attorneys from Iowa who tend to go as well, and so I was really grateful for the opportunity. And we're going to go to our city clerk's office. Nothing from the clerk's office. All right, just all smiles. <laughs> <laughs> Item number 15, could I get a motion to adjourn? So I'll move. Taylor. Second. Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 6 to 0. Have a good night, all.